Good morning. <coughs> and I'm coming from Crete, as you see here, from the island from Greece. And the topic uh, we will discuss today, CNS malignancies, and I will focus on intracranial tumors. We all know that uh, dealing with uh, intracranial tumors, we have primary neoplasms in one third of the cases, metastatic disease in the other one third, and non-glial other tumors, such as meningiomas, lymphomas, pineal tumors in the other one third. So the first, our primary goals during the diagnostic workup, our primary goals as a radiologist is first of all, to detect the lesion, to locate the lesion in the specific anatomic compartment and also evaluate the extension of the tumor or the resultant mass effect. Also, to make some clues and find imaging characteristics for the morphology and the composition of the tumor, trying to characterize it. And also, don't forget that there are sometimes some non-neoplastic lesions producing images similar, just like tumors. Without any doubt, MRI is the imaging modality of choice to detect and characterize an intracranial tumor. But in the routine clinical practice, is in an emergency CT room when we find the, uh, the initial diagnosis of an intracranial tumor is made typically on a CT uh, with a patient which presents with uh, an acute neurologic deficit, for example, or seizures. So many people propose from 98 that uh, since the next step is MRI, you can skip contrast on CT uh, for reasons related to cost, of course. I would like to focus, we will also discuss the new developments briefly, perfusion, spectroscopy, and all this stuff, and later on during the workshop. But my goal is to emphasize those traditional criteria. Uh, they are very, very important. And those are the age of the patient. Since we have different histologic types of tumors in children and different in adults, <coughs> and the location of the tumor. We have different kinds of tumors in the intra or extraaxial space, in the supra or the infratentorial uh, compartments. And also, we all know the traditional criteria. We know the margins of the tumor, edema, if there is a cyst, necrosis, hemorrhage, calcification, melanin <coughs> or fat, vascularity, cellularity, and also the pattern of enhancement, which has some unique fix features dealing with uh, intracranial tumors. So as you see here, in the supratentorial compartment, in adults, we have metastatic disease, gliomas, lymphomas, sarcomas, and in children, gagliogliomas, dinat tumors, neuroblastomas, or other paleocytic astrocytomas. In the infratentorial compartment, we have metastatic disease, the most common tumor in the posterior fossa, hemangioblastoma in adults, and gliomas. And in children, totally different histology, as you see here. Starting with metastatic disease, typically they have the hematogenous spread, and they locate at the corticotomedalloid junction, producing multiple lesions. We all know that there's a extensive vasogenic edema, and the pattern of enhancement, all the metastatic disease in the brain enhance. Typical metastatic disease on CT and MRI, you see the nodular pattern of enhancement and the ring-like sharp borders, well-defined margins, and vasogenic edema out of proportion. And this is similar on MRI. Multiple lesions, supratendoral, infratendoral, multiple ring-like enhancement lesions, typical of metastatic disease. In the posterior fossa, it's very important when we are dealing with an adult, as I'm used to say to the residents, the first, the second, and the third differential is metastatic disease. In the posterior fossa, in adults, if we see a tumor, our first differential, and this tumor producing, as you see here, displacement, mass effect, you see the signs of hydrocephalus, the dilatation of the temporal horns. This is a case of a, a large metastatic disease in the posterior fossa. Sometimes we may have 
metastatic disease. This is pre and post contrast CT. And we have hemorrhoids. And we have typical hemorrhagic metastasis, metastatic disease from kidney, breast, thyroid, and uh, bronchogenic CA. Hemat uh, hematogenous uh, hemorrhagic metastatic disease. We may have this kind of appearance, T1 pre-contrast, and this is post-contrast with enhancement. With this, we, we can see this high intensity on T1, low on T2. In case we don't have here hemorrhage, but we have melanoma, and we know that melanin has paramagnetic properties and giving this appearance sometimes high intensity on T1. Remember this. Those are multiple dots, those metastatic disease. And you see that if we use triple dose of gadolinium, we may see millions of them. And this is the, the obvious question, what's the meaning? But this is very important when we are dealing with one, with a solitary metastatic lesion, and a surgical uh, procedure is in uh, consideration. So in this case, we have to, to give triple dose of gadolinium, not in this case like this. Moving to the most interesting part, gliomas. Gliomas is a very heterogeneous group of tumors. They are very common, unfortunately. If we see a solitary supratentorial mass, in half of the cases, it's a glioma. Middle age, male to female, the ratio is 3 to 2. And we can divide grossly the low-grade astrocytomas, the type 1 and 2, the benign, so-called benign astrocytomas, and the very malignant uh, astrocytomas, the type 3 and 4. We'll see examples later on. This is a typical low-grade astrocytoma. Deep temporal lobe, the very common typical presentation here is the is scissors. T2 flare, you see this vague high intensity, and minimal or absence of contrast enhancement. As you see, non-hemorrhagic, the enhancement is an uncommon feature, and there is a calcification, associated calcification in 15 to 20 percent of the cases. This is the type 3 anaplastic astrocytoma. We have some on T1 and T2, a moderate mass effect, and some degree, moderate degree of irregular enhancement. Anaplastic type 3 astrocytoma. Another case of anaplastic astrocytoma, maybe when you see this image at first, you can see that it's like an infarct. And sometimes anaplastic astrocytoma has uh, these sharp borders, but not linear, quite rounded. You see only minimal degree of enhancement. And remember, before we're going to all these advanced neuroimaging techniques to do here, for example, spectroscopy or perfusion, it's very easy to differentiate an infarct from a tumor. But remember, we are physicians, not only radiologists. So we can ask the patient the history. The history here is, is the key factor. Remember this. The history, if we're dealing with an infarct, is an acute, acute neurologic deficit here. And the history could be totally different if we were dealing with an, a brain tumor, and in this case of anaplastic astrocytoma. And this is the most malignant form, the glioblastoma multiforme, the GBM. The most common, unfortunately, is the most common glioma with a very dismal prognosis. And allow me to hear a, a comment. With all this uh, tremendous advance in, on neuroimaging, we can only, not only detect the tumor, but uh, make a tissue characterization. But unfortunately, we don't have the similar progress in our treatment options. So GBN remains one of the most fatal and malignant humors ever known in humanity. Uh, they say, many people, that if we find a, a person with GBM, very malignant tumor, and we leave him alone, he will die in three and four months or four months. And with the optimal, the ideal therapy, including surgical resection, chemotherapy, or radiotherapy, all these, the medial survival time is about one year. Despite all this research of decades, GBN remains resistant 
in many treatments which have proved very, very effective in other solid tumors in body. So it remains one of the more fatal neoplasms ever known. It can be primary, the novo type 4 astrocytoma, or secondary, from a lower grade of an astrocytoma to transform to a GBM. Diffusely infiltrative tumor, this is the very bad characteristic, and sometimes gets this uh, characteristic butterfly or multicentric appearance. In conventional MRI, those are the imaging findings consistent with malignancy. The peritumoral edema necrosis, the infiltrative pattern, hemorrhage, increased cellularity, and the uh, breakdown of the blood-brain barrier. And this is the typical image of a GBM. The tumor on T2 and flare images, you see the abnormal enhancement, and all this edema. And if we we have to be correct, it's not edema. It's not edema when we are dealing with a primary tumor. It's a combination, all this area around, it's a combination of vasogenic edema along with infiltration, infiltration of tumor cells. We know from histology that uh, dealing with primary intraparenchymal brain tumors, we have fingers of tumor along the perivascular spaces, not only outside the rim of enhancement, but sometimes some people believe well beyond the area of abnormal T2 hyperintensity. We may see tumor here. That's why the advanced neuroimaging techniques are very useful. And this is the typical butterfly appearance. It's very nice, nice. It's well seen on coronal views. This is the tumor going crossing the corpus callosum here, going to the other side, the butterfly appearance. And this is another very aggressive looking tumor. Very large tumor, you see the solid part, all this gray on flare, there's a T2. This is the tumor and the edema. And somebody expect that post contrast would be very extensive diffuse enhancement. And it's not the case here. You see only this minimal degree of enhancement. And this is, I believe, a take home message. Dealing with intracranial primary tumors, sometimes the degree of enhancement does not reflect the degree of malignancy. And this has an explanation. You, we, you know that uh, we have in, in the brain uh, capillaries some unique endothelial cells which con produce a very continuous wall and restrict the movement from uh, many substances from the bloodstream to the interstitial space. This is the so-called very complex phenomenon of blood-brain barrier. And regarding primary brain tumors, we have not uncommonly uh, tumor cells with functioning blood-brain barrier. So in this very aggressive tumor, you see only this minimal degree of enhancement. And vice versa, we may see disrupted or absence of blood-brain barrier in cases of benign tumors. Such in this case, it's obvious, a case of a falx meningioma, or in this case, a very typical choroid plexus papilloma. Another image of multicentric glioma, you see multiple areas, multiple, multiple foci, multicentric glioma. And this is another type, the uh, gliosarcoma, another type, which is. Uh, Nice to remember it because it's usually associated with extracranial meds. It's a common feature here. Sometimes some imaging features are very pathognomonic, such as in this case, CT, pre and post contrast. You see those abrupt, very large calcifications. So the first differential here is oligodendroglioma. You see the association is 70 to 90 percent of the cases. It's a located peripherally near the cortex, and uh, typically has a moderate degree of enhancement. This is another case of oligodendroglioma, and T2 flare, and post-contrast. You see the peripheral location. Other features very characteristic is the location. You see this pre- and post-contrast MRI coronal views. You see the focus, the lesion here, at the very specific position, location, at the area of 
the foramen of Monroe. So it's a case of giant cell astrocytoma in a patient with tuberous sclerosis. And in other cases, when we are dealing with infratedorial tumor, cystic tumor, this is the CT and post contrast going to the upper views, upper cuts, you see this dot which enhances this mural nodule, which is characteristic of an hemangioblastoma. Hemangioblastomas sometimes tend to cross the craniocervical junction and produce, you know, going from up to, to the neck. And this is the cystic part, you see post contrast without enhancement. And this is the nodule, which in this case is larger, which enhances. And sometimes uh, hemangioblastomas, when they cross the craniocervical junction, may produce non specific neck pain. Remember this. We're dealing every day with many, many, many cervical MRIs, dealing with degeneration, of course. This is the main issue. But remember to look upwards to the foramen magnum. Sometimes you can come with a diagnosis like this hemangioblastoma crossing down. Minigeoma, just one word, typical location, falx phenoid wings. This is the falx meningioma with a dural tail, very typical. And this is another case of meningioma. And I put this case to illustrate the appearance on T2 weighted image. The characteristic in meningiomas is not the enhancement. Sometimes other tumors also, they have homogeneous, very intense enhancement. But few tumors in the brain has low density on T2 weighted images. That means very cellular, very dense tumors. So that you see low on T2, intense homogeneous enhancement in this case of meningioma. Another tumor is lymphoma, which in the past it was very rare, but now it's increased in the frequency in the area of immunosuppression and AIDS patients. Has this typical location, deep subependymal location around the corpus callosum. And again, it's another very high, highly cellular tumor. So again, low on T2, if you are doing CTs, hyper dense, and quite homogeneous enhancement. This is a case of a lymphoma. You see the deep on T1, deep subependymal location on T2. It's quite low on T2. And post contrast, you see the abnormal enhancement. In children, we have different types of histology, as I said before. You see a tumor here, a cystic tumor, a diaphragm in here, a flare, T2, post contrast, we see the neural nodule. As I have mentioned before, it's a typical for an hemangioblastoma, okay? But it's not the case here. This is another take home message. We may see tumors with the same imaging characteristics but with different age and location, there are different tumors. Here, if we are dealing with the imaging characteristics, this is an hemangioblastoma. But here it's a 10 years old boy, 10 years old boy, and we are in the supratentorial compartment. So the most probable diagnosis here is pilocytic astrocytoma. Other tumors in children, you see these uh, signs of obstruction obstructive hydrocephalus, you see the subependymal spread of CSF, and this is the tumor and the tectum without any abnormal enhancement, and this characteristic midbrain tectal glioma, and this unfortunate five years old boy. The fourth ventricle is normal. In the brainstem, we may have also diffuse brainstem gliomas, T1, T2 weighted images, and only a small part enhances. And of course, this is a, another typical tumor, filling the midline, filling the, the fourth ventricle. T1, T2, again, is a very cellular tumor. Low intensity on T2 enhances. This is, of course, a medulloblastoma. However, conventional MRI has many limitations, and you have to know them. First of all, it's very difficult by using CT and conventional MRI to delineate the limits, as I said before, of the tumor. Also to evaluate tumor behavior and grading, to differentiate primary tumor from metastatic disease, to differentiate the residual tumor 
versus radiation necrosis, and also to differentiate other non-neoplastic lesions. So we use those weapons, diffusion, perfusion, and spectroscopy mainly, to help this situation. First of all, diffusion. Diffusion in the routine clinical practice, we use this to differentiate non-neoplastic lesions from neoplasms. But also, there are many papers in the literature describing that there is this very interesting inverse correlation between diffusivity and tumor cellularity. In other words, more simple, if we are dealing with a cellular, high-grade tumor, we have restricted diffusion. We have lower ADC values. So that's why this inverse correlation. And also we can evaluate uh, with accuracy the tumor extension, and you can use diffusion tensor imaging to take these very fascinating imaging of fiber tractography. This is one of our, in our department, one of our residents. He spent a lot of time there to take these normal images of corpus callosum. You can take fiber tra tra tractography and uh, images like an art gallery. Uh, but this is very important. It's a highly recommended paper in AJNR 2004. And uh, Jellison describes all those white matter tracts, the visualization of the the fiber tractography can be deviated, infiltrated, will be edematous and destroyed by the tumor. So we may have destruction, as you see here. Those are the fibers, the normal side, destruction or infiltration of the fibers, or in this case, destruction again, and edematous. In the case of meningioma, as you see here, we have deviation, displacement of the fibers. From our department, another uh, infiltrating tumor with destruction, infiltration of uh, the corona radiata here, as you see, and another tumor, a metastatic disease with the destruction of the fibers. Fiber tractography is a very fascinating and promising method, but keep in mind that it has many limitations. It's difficult to resolve crossing fibers. It's a user-defined process, and keep this in mind. So we can use this knowing the limitations and the potentials. But of course, it's very useful for a neurosurgeon to have functional MRI on the, other, on the one hand and the other hand to have fiber tractography and the tumor. It's very useful. MR spectroscopy, giving information about the biochemistry, the composition of the tumor. We all know the increase of choline, giving information about the turnover, the proliferation, the destruction of neurons, decrease NAA and differentiate tumor necrosis and in the mind monitor follow-up. This is a very simple graphic. Those are the metabolites in normal brain. And when we have this reversed angle, this is a tumor. We have the increase of choline and decrease of NAA. Though this angle is the normal one, and this is the abnormal in the case of a tumor. And we may have the single voxel spectroscopy as you see here, you can see the, the peak of choline, very aggressive, uh, very malignant tumor. And multivoxel, as you see here, multivoxel spectroscopy, when we have information, you see the voxel here, from the peritumoral region, from the normal side, from the core of the tumor, we have a spectral, a spectrum uh, metabolites, as you see here, different regions. And perfusion, perfusion in my perspective is the most useful tool because it's very easy to perform perfusion. Everybody injects contrast, so in a short time we have information about the tumor margins. This is important, RCBV correlates with high grade of malignancy. And at this point, I would like to differentiate something I think very important. It's different, the abnormal enhancement and the increased perfusion. It's not necessarily the same. When we check the base, uh, contrast in the patient, the areas of the, the tumor which enhance the means that reflects the, the areas with breakdown of blood-brain barrier. The areas of increased perfusion reflect vascular proliferation and the development of many vascular networks, imaging findings much more specific 
for the presence and the grading of the tumor. So by using uh, perfusion, we may differentiate solitary excuse me, versus uh, metastatic disease versus glioma, lymphoma versus toxoplasmosis in AIDS patients, non-neoplastic lesions, and monitor follow-up. Many people use uh, the images of contrast-enhanced MRI to guide the, the biopsies, but the correct thing is to use the, the maps, as you see here, if you superimpose the perfusion maps for the most malignant part of the tumor. Trying to grade astrocytomas and gliomas is a very difficult task. Sometimes it's impossible. And this is due to two reasons. First of all, the intratumoral heterogeneous composition, and this is very important. Those tumors tend to differentiate into more malignant lesions over time. So the, in the ideal situation, to have the correct grade is to get the biopsy from the most malignant part of the tumor. And the most helpful tool for this is radiology, neuroradiology, and perfusion imaging. This is a very nice example, illustrating the importance of perfusion, given to me by Professor Meng Lo, who made a tremendous work on perfusion and tum brain tumors. This is a right thalamic glioma, as you see here, flare and T2 images, giving the appearance of quite benign tumor. Post contrast, no evidence of enhancement. And on perfusion map, no increased perfusion. And you see here, RCBV is 1.42. And uh, there's a paper from Meng Lo, and he gave a, a threshold of 1.75 to divide low from high grade astrocytomas. So here, in all this, gives the information about a benign, a low grade astrocytoma. And this is the case. More than a year in the follow up, you see again the tumor the same and the perfusion is even decreased. Look at this case now. Quite similar. In the frontal region, flare, T2, no enhancement, no any evidence of enhancement. But look at this perfusion 4.23, very increased. Only by perfusion we have prognosis of the tumor. And as you see here, four months later, you see the tumor. The transformation of the tumor is a very, very bad situation here. So RCBV went to 13, as you see here, is a very good prognostic also index. Also, another application is to differentiate primary versus secondary tumor, because in the peritumular region, it's obvious that in a metastatic disease, the peritumular region is a pure vasogenic edema. So the perfusion would be normal in this case. And also just one word of a functional MRI. This is a zoom. This is the area of interest, and this is the tumor. And we can take 2D or 3D. But, and the last few minutes, just to, men to mention that sometimes there are non-neoplastic lesions, such as heterotopias, infarctions, abscesses, other lesions as uh, MS, vascular lesions, hematomas, and they may produce images similar with tumors. And we have to differentiate those. This is a case of a quite typical T1 and T2 weighted image. This popcorn appearance, very bright on T2, bright and, and low, this inhomogeneous appearance of uh, this quite benign lesion, which is, of course, a cavernous angioma. This is a very impressive case, which at first gives a, the impression of a very, imp very malignant tumor, but it's not a tumor. It's a, this kind of tumor affective MS. Sometimes MS has this space occupied, very large space occupied lesions, giving the appearance of a tumor. And of course, the new advanced imaging techniques, such as perfusion, are very helpful. This is the one case. One person ha uh, has MS and the other has a metastatic disease here. And it's very difficult to differentiate those. Eh? This is post-contrast. They enhance flare and T2. Just perfusion. You see on this area of MS, there is no increased perfusion. There is no proliferation, no new vascularity. 
And in the, ca the case of uh, tumor, of course, we have increased perfusion. And also, yeah, the last is the brain abscesses. Sometimes they produce images with vasogenic edema, as you see here, and this very, very characteristic for those who know that the capsule is very dark on T2-weighted image, dealing with an abscess, and it's thinner in the inner side. And this is the daughter abscess. But if we use this is the brain abscess, and if, if we use the new advanced techniques, it's very easy, easy to differentiate those. One of the patients has metastatic disease, and the other patient has brain abscesses. I think it's impossible for, for anybody to differentiate those. Just by using diffusion imaging and ADC maps, we can see that in this case, we have restricted diffusion, very bright on the diffusion images. And this is very necrotic material, like water. So in this case, we have abscesses with the viscous material inside the pus, and in this case, the necrotic composition of a, a metastatic disease. So to conclude, MRI is the imaging modality of choice to detect and characterize a brain lesion, to establish the diagnosis, to assess the type and the grade of the tumor, to guide the med medical or surgical treatment, to monitor follow-up, and to give all this information. Nowadays, the radiological diagnosis is not strictly just to detect, to identify a tumor. We can give information about, the, of course, the morphology, but the composition of the tumor, the hemodynamics, the metabolism, and the physiology. Thank you very much.